I am ready. So uh, Miss Lisa got me these new snappy glasses. Look at this. It was uh, very strange uh, to go to the optometrist. You know, usually you grab all these glasses and try them on. Oh no, you can't touch them glasses. No way. So they had this guy that came out and said, sir, I'm gonna get you your glasses and I'm gonna go pick them. So he went, put the first ones on and he's like, Nope, that's not you. And he sanitized them and put them back on. He got me the second pair and said, that's perfect. It looks marvelous. So it at least helped me feel good that you're doing okay. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't see them. I only look through them. So uh, they seem to be working good for looking through, and that's all that matters. So praise the Lord. We're going to go today. And um, last week we brought a message about God's Holy Spirit. If you remember, it was um, we talked about the book of Acts. And it's uh, sometimes in older Bibles called the Acts of the Apostles. And uh, we don't see it as the book of the Apostles or the Acts of the Apostles, but really the Acts of the Holy Spirit working through Apostles, working through other men and women, like one we're going to look at today is Stephen, starting the church and getting it going and continuing to this very day to dwell within us. So we looked at the Holy Spirit. In fact, we'll look a little bit more and uh, we're in the story. We've been there in the story under chapter 28 for four weeks because it's just so full of things. And uh, this week we're going to complete chapter 28. So next week we'll be into chapter 29, uh, heading towards the very end of the book. So in fact, we plowed through over 400 pages of the story this year. So it's been a good year in that regard. Many other aspects, not the best of years, but the story has been really good. The story of 2020, eh, I'm ready to see it in the rearview mirror and see 2021. Okay, so, uh, but I am thankful to live in 2020 and not 1920 or 1918, back in the day when they didn't have, I mean, they were just learning to put a mask on their face in uh, 1918 when the flu pandemic came. So I'm glad to be alive today where there's good medical care. Now, so we're looking at this story today. We're also going to be in the book of Acts, chapter 7 and chapter 12, principally today. And this morning, I want to bring to you a thought um, that God is sovereign over everything that happens in the world, and including you. God is sovereign over you. So we're going to see a story today about somebody who is like, oh yeah, God's not over, sovereign over me. I'm my own little guy. And um, I will make my own ways. Well, we're going to see a grand caution today because it didn't end so well, according to the Bible story about him. So uh, this morning, uh, just a reminder about Acts chapter 1, verse uh, 8. These are Jesus' words. But the Holy Spirit will come upon you and uh, give you power. And so this is really important for you to see the power. But what was the power to be principally used for? Then you will tell everyone about me. That's what Jesus wanted you to do with the Holy Spirit. Look for opportunities for God's Spirit to lead you to share the great news that you have. Wouldn't it be awful if uh, yesterday I went to Georgie's fifth birthday party and there was this awesome cake that um, my daughter had made. It was um, after a character from Frozen called Elsa. Why are you guys laughing? <laughs> no. It was an awesome cake, but could you imagine if we got ready to have that cake and Georgie blew out the candles and she said, that's my cake. You don't get any. And the cake tasted wonderful, Juwan, didn't it? So it was a great cake and uh, it would have been terrible if Georgie would have not shared. Well, that's the same with Jesus. You tasted and saw that Jesus was good and made an impact on your life and then you said, that's my Jesus. You don't get it. That would be the equivalent. That would be like as selfish as Georgie not offering her birthday cake. I can't even imagine Georgie doing that. In fact, she's like, Papa, let me give you some more. But I was disappointed. I said, no, thank you. So um, that's true. I didn't say that on the spaghetti and meatballs. So I was like, more, please. But um, that's the same with you with Jesus. You've got to share Jesus with others. So when we take a look at it, we're going to look at how the Holy Spirit helps us to do that. Now, speaking of the Holy Spirit, I want to wrap up a little bit of teachings about the Holy Spirit so we have a great understanding about this person we know as the Holy Spirit. And the first is the Holy Spirit is not an it. 
The Holy Spirit is no more an it than God the Father is an it or Jesus is an it. He's a he. He has a personality. The Holy Spirit has a mind, has a will, and the Holy Spirit even has emotions. The Holy Spirit is your advocate to heaven. Speaks to Jesus, who stands beside the Father, and the Father is up in heaven. In fact, Jesus is up in heaven. Jesus went up in the clouds, and he's going to come back the same way, according to the Bible. But we talk about Jesus being in our heart. But when we're talking about Jesus being in our heart, it's really he, the Holy Spirit, that dwells within us. So true. So this advocate, which we learned about back in the Gospel of John, talks to the Father, and the Father uh, talks back to the Holy Spirit. And um, Jesus even said this would happen, because Jesus said, I am praying to the Father that you will have another, just like Jesus, advocate. But unlike Jesus, this advocate dwells within us. And the promise is that this Holy Spirit will never leave you. Like we say today, this is like I don't send these song, this sermon to Faye beforehand and say, hey, Faye, these are the songs we should sing today because uh, this maybe once or twice a year I'll do that. But um, you know, I didn't, um, Faye knew the songs before I knew the sermon. So the Lord gave it to me on Friday. And uh, through Friday night and Saturday, we uh, penned down what the Lord gave. So, but he's a good, good father, isn't he? And he will never leave us alone. That prayer that Jesus asked the Father on the day of Pentecost was filled in spades, as they say. Absolutely right. That Holy Spirit came down powerfully. And we're going to see another example of that power being exhibited today. Now, the Holy Spirit also feels sorrow. In Ephesians, which is a letter from Paul, Ephesians chapter 4, 30 says this, And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way that you live your life. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you'll be saved on the day of redemption. Scripture also teaches us not only does the Holy Spirit have these emotions, but that Holy Spirit will always be there with you. He's that small voice that speaks to you. And so um, I shared a scripture verse the week before from Psalm 73, verses 23 and 24, about um, the psalmist talking about in his mind how God is always by his right side. It said this, Yet I know that I am always with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me up to glory. Now, so at that time, the Holy Spirit was not shared very often. King David had the Holy Spirit, a few other people, Elijah, Elisha, a few folks in the Old Testament had, but today, universal. Holy Spirit is available to all who will call on the name of the Lord and uh, trust in Christ as their Savior. It's the immediate benefit that you get is that Holy Spirit coming in to dwell within you. So when that happens, uh, we have this guarantee that happens. But this alongside this presence that he was trying to describe, the second part was right. You guide me with your counsel, and then one day you're taking me to heaven. That's exactly what's going to happen. So when you uh, breathe your last breath here before the Lord comes back, and he calls you to heaven, what happens is the Holy Spirit takes you to heaven, where you're going to get to see Jesus, right? Which is going to be an amazing uh, day when that happens. And up there, let's say you're missing a leg because they got blown off in the war, or you, your kidneys aren't working anymore, or we got some other ailment. When you get to heaven, all that stuff's gone. It's all right. That's an amazing place to be, right? So that's something to look forward to. And most of us would say, I look forward to that. It's my hope, but it's a down the road hope. Not today, please, Lord, right? Amen. <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with you saying that. But there'll come a time that you have settled in your heart. It's time for me to be with the Lord. So um, also, the Holy Spirit, well, he, because he is God, is also co-eternal. He has all the natures. He coexisted. Uh, he was with the Father and the Son in creation. If you go back and read Genesis carefully, you can see that plurality there. They are all one, but at the same time, they have different personalities. 
It's a bit of a mystery. There's no doubt about it um, that it is. But we can understand aspects of this truth. So we don't have to be completely in the dark and go, ah, it's just an act of faith. No, we can know some things. So I was thinking about what some things that we know for sure. We know that God the Father planned our salvation. We have studied about that, folks, for a whole year in the story. How God is restoring everything with this higher story to what it used to be back in the garden time. There will be a new heavens and a new earth. Death will be gone. Sin will be gone. It will be fully restored the way that he wanted it to be back then. So God planned our salvation. Let's think about Jesus for a second. Jesus earned our salvation. Jesus earned our salvation by a sinless life, by being faithful to what God called him to do, and by going to the cross and shedding his precious blood. There's no doubt about that. Our Lord Jesus earned our salvation, the Son. And finally, those are past tense things, but present tense. Present tense is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit decrees over you to, to the whole world, but to God the Father too, that you are his son or you are his daughter. That's an amazing decree. So uh, when God looks down and sees you, he sees you as a son. He doesn't see your, your sin. He doesn't see your shortfalls. He sees you as his son or his, his daughter. It's an amazing thing to think about. And finally, that Holy Spirit empowers you. He empowers you with uh, salvation. He empowers you as a witness. And he empowers you to do great things that he's called you to do. Every one of us, including Dylan May, has a special calling on their lives to be realized as they go through. And it's going to be different. Won't it be exciting, Marcus, to see what God has for you? I can't wait to see what it's going to be. Right now, he's gifted you with sports, but he, and maybe that's the gifting that you're going to walk in as you serve him, but maybe there's other things that are going to come in your life as you go through your journey. That's so exciting to see that. But also, as Grandpa's sitting there, it's the things that Grandpa's going to do in your life, sir, because he's got great plans for all of your days. I think that's so exciting to think about that. And he blesses us with his presence all the time. Amongst these blessings are, I'm going to say, a blessing that I received this week. I've been praying for my sister going up north to go deer hunting. I had already known all my cadets were shut out, all those that skipped school and didn't go to school, went deer hunting instead. They all went up north. Not one of them even saw a deer, and I asked every one of them. I was like, Lord, you could be with my favorite Marine and bless her with some deer. And then I get this picture, she's got a trailer full of them. I mean, she's the deer slayer up there or something. That was really something to see. So that was a blessing for me. I know it was a blessing for you, but it was a blessing for me to see that too. I love seeing the Lord answer my prayers. Don't you? Yeah. That's really great when you see that happen. Mm -hmm. Now today, this is the last thing I want to share about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can go into a realm with the Father that no one else can go into but Jesus. He can go to the Father in the heavenly realm and spend time there and have the very mind of the Father. So let's go to 1 Corinthians if you had a Bible. And um, today we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I just want to show you about this. Now, I was like, hallelujah, that is so true. In chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, um, Paul would write in this, he, he's talking about a mystery and um, how the Holy Spirit had revealed things to Paul that had never been revealed ever before. Um, one, one of the big things is about what's going to happen at the end of time. There's these allusions in the Old Testament, but Paul got a big revelation. But this is what uh, Paul said here in verse 10 of chapter 2, 1 Corinthians. Now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit. So Paul is acknowledging that I only know this because the Holy Spirit has revealed that to me. Since the Spirit searches everything. This is in my Bible a big S, not a lower S. Not a lowercase S like I, I drank some spirits or I'm in the Spirit today while I was watching Ohio State uh, get scored on by Indiana. You know, that was, and I was like, ooh. I was fired up. Now, this is the Holy Spirit, big S. The Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. 
Now, we cannot possibly know the mind of God. Impossible. We know some of his attributes, some of his ways, the scriptures reveal them to us. But the Holy Spirit knows the fullness of God the Father. He knows all of his ways. For who knows a person's thoughts except his spirit within him? That's a lowercase s. So you don't know what I'm thinking right now. You don't know, I don't know what you're thinking, right? I, you might be thinking, I can't wait for pastor to be done because I'm going to go home and I have this awesome meal being cooked right now. I can almost smell it right now and my tummy's going, rrr, rrr. and so I don't know what you're thinking with that spirit within you. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the big S spirit of God. That's it. That's what scripture says. Now, we have not received the spirit of this world, the lowercase s, and I don't want the spirit of this world because it's about greed and take and what's in it for me. And um, I've been teaching classes on ethics to my cadets lately, and it's a situational ethics. I, I make my decisions in life on how good it feels to me and what's in it for me and forget everybody else. That's the spirit of this world. But the spirit who comes from God, big S, the spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. God has great things to reveal to you as you go through your life. We talked about Marcus and Joe for just a minute, but every one of us, God has great plans, a whole life full of plans, a whole life full of plans, and he will reveal those things to you through his Holy Spirit at just the right time. Now, that's a good thing. I don't want to know about every single day I'm going to live beforehand or something like that. But sometimes it's on my mind. Um, you know, what's my next years that the Lord has given me? How should I live and what should I do? And all those things are on our hearts. But it's the Holy Spirit that can find them out. Now, let's go for a moment, now that we have established who the Holy Spirit is, let's go into that Acts time. Um, the end of chapter 6, start of chapter 7, and then we'll go over to 12. And fully understanding that the Holy Spirit knows, let's go look at the points for today in the sovereignty of our Lord. The first of our points today is this, and this is uh, for our notes today. In our notes today, the first is Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he was so full of the Holy Spirit that I can't think of any other New Testament person that seemed to have this fullness, because you can even see it in Stephen. This is uh, mentioned specially in Scripture, in uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 15. It's also in the story as well. In the story on page 398 is where you can read this account about Stephen. And um, so we're on uh, chapter 6 of Acts, and I just wanted to share for a brief moment about uh, that. Uh, Acts verse uh, 15. So I want to paint a picture just for a few moments. So this is what was going on in the uh, book of Acts at that time. So Stephen was uh, not one of the apostles. Uh, he comes to salvation. He's fired up. He gets God's Holy Spirit within him. Uh, he serves. He's a servant. He serves others within the early church. So he's uh, selected as not one of the apostles. He's not the uh, replacement for Judas, for example, uh, the betrayer. Uh, no, he is uh, hand-selected by the apostles to serve the church. And not only is he serving, he also realizes the Holy Spirit wants me to tell others about Jesus. And so part of the people he, he's telling is the very Sanhedrin, the ruling council of Jewish leaders. And he does a great job for a whole chapter of scripture just laying out the story of what God has been doing, the upper story, through the uh, patriarchs, through Moses, through Abraham. There's no hypocrisy in what he's teaching. There's no error in what he's teaching. But the more and more he teaches them, the more angry these Pharisees and Sadducees get. They are so mad, they are like uh, gnashing their teeth almost. Do you read that description? You're like, just give me a piece of that, Stephen. I've just about had it all I can take. They're so fired up. And then all of a sudden, he's speaking to me. Imagine they're probably in a raised position, looking down on Stephen who's standing before him. And then all of a sudden, they, the room grows silent because they're looking at Stephen 
And Stephen is glowing like the face of an angel because of the presence of the Holy Spirit on him. Now, we don't uh, have people that come walking through our door that are glowing like angels. We have folks that are here that, are, that have God's Holy Spirit within them. But this is a powerful, miraculous event just before our first martyr in uh, uh, Christian history, Matt Stephen, the first to die for his faith after Jesus, right? And if you read this account later on on your own, look at all the parallels about how Jesus' journey to the cross was and uh, Stephen's journey to his uh, stoning was. There's so many uh, parallels there. So uh, there we are seeing this amazing thing happen, fullness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it kind of reminds me of a story about Moses when he had spent time with God the Father on uh, the mount there, Mount Sinai, and had come down off of there. He was so full of the presence of God that they had to put a veil over his face because people were scared to be in the presence of Moses. And so like when Moses was having some issues with him, he'd just take that veil back and they'd be like, whoa, the fullness of God. And they would be listening to what Moses had to say because he would remind them with his presence. That's the next case I see that is right here. It's an amazing thing to see. Well, our next point this morning is this. And this comes from uh, chapter 12. And this causes us to go, huh? How can this possibly happen? Well, it's in, this, it's in the story, and it's in the uh, Bible, um, Acts chapter 12. James, the apostle, dies by the order of King Herod. Now, this is really something to share with you. I'm going to read to you from page uh, 403 in the story this morning, the account of how this happened. It almost happens just like what I just shared with that short sentence. Here we are in the midst of the uh, book of Acts, and all of a sudden, bam, it says this. It was at this time that King Herod, now you remember that King Herod, right? That King Herod, he must be an old cuss by now, because wasn't it King Herod that uh, went after Jesus, you know, when he was in Bethlehem and stuff? This is a long time ago, man. This guy's been around for a long time. Well, maybe not. We'll share more in a minute. But King Herod arrested some of those who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. So apparently uh, Herod had had enough of these uh, Christians, these early believers, that were setting the world on fire, telling everybody about Christ. And miracles were happening, and people were getting encouragement, and they weren't relying on old, dusty, crusty ways of living, and even jeopardizing Herod's position. So he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Now, I don't know if he put him to death himself or ordered, kill this guy right now. But uh, just right there, so that he's getting ready to persecute, and then James is dead in that one short sentence. When he saw that this met with the approval amongst the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. That's just before Passover. So uh, what's happening here is at least a year of time has gone by. At least a year. Because you remember this all took place during Jesus' time as well. So after arresting him, they put him in prison, this being Peter, and handed him over to a guard by four squads of four soldiers each. And Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for them, or for him, excuse me. So there's a, a difference there. It could be a very important difference between James and Peter's situation. James, there was no time to pray. Arrest and death, he's, he's gone just like that. Now, who is this Herod that we're talking about? This is called uh, Herod, he's King Herod, but he's Herod Agrippa. Now, he's the grandson of Herod the Great that uh, went after the infants in Bethlehem trying to find Jesus to have Jesus put to death. That's Matthew chapter 2, that part of our Christmas story, right? He's also the nephew of the next Herod that was King Herod, and that's uh, Herod Antipas. Now, um, he was the one, that Herod was the one that had John the Baptist have his head removed. So this is the third bad Herod. 
So uh, maybe um, in our story, we might think three bad Herods, you're out. Maybe wouldn't that be good, like baseball? It would be interesting to know, though, when we think about what just happened to James, what the thoughts of John was. You know, John, the disciple John, now the apostle John, the writer of the gospel of John, the uh, revelation of John, uh, John chapter 1, John chapter 2, John chapter 3. Well, that's his brother. That's his older brother. You know, he's got his older brother. He's looking up to his older brother. And he's gone. Boom. Just like that. Now, that would get your attention. And we wonder what John thought about that. Now, this is uh, James. Not some just lesser apostle James that we don't know. This is James in a close inner circle of Jesus. It was James, his brother John, and Peter that often were found in a special position and pulled aside from the others to get special teaching and to see special things with Jesus. So this is like one, this is like the man, so to speak, right? And he's gone just like that. Now, the reason I mentioned it's interesting to think what John thought about it. Let's also think about what James and John's mother thought about it. You say, wait, why are we talking about somebody's mom? Because she came to Jesus back in Matthew and also in Mark and came to Jesus with the two boys there and said, hey, Jesus, when you get to heaven, because I believe you're heading there, uh, when, when my sons get there, can they sit on thrones with you and rule over heaven? And uh, Jesus uh, said to, to her and to the boys that were standing there, you know, basically, that's not for me to grant. That's for God alone to grant that. Um, but then Jesus also said this, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? He said that to the two boys. And the boy's answer was, sure we can. No problem, Jesus. We'll never let you down. We're there for you. Well, we can look at this moment and say, James did drink from that cup, a bitter cup, right? Because uh, Christ walked all the way to his death, being faithful to God. And according to scriptures, so did James. And James was taken away. So the same story that we're reading about in chapter 12, just the very next verse, Peter's arrested, right? Um, Acts chapter 12, verses 3 through 11 is that part of the story. And there's no explanation in the scriptures that I've ever been able to see on why James died and why Peter was spared. We could uh, speculate and we could say, well, it's because the church fasted and prayed. And so when we fast and pray, um, people are not going to be martyred. They're always going to be taken care of. They're always going to be healed. It's always going to go well. But you know what? Um, in the Bible, that is not always true. And in our lives, it's not always true. Does that mean we don't ask? Does that mean we don't fast? Heavens, no. Because Christ also teaches you have not because you have not asked. Right? Ergo, you could sit back and say, well, I don't need to pray because God already knows what's going to happen. Yeah, he knew you weren't going to pray. Okay, and there are examples in Scripture where God's heart was changed by the prayer of people. We just don't know. And so we have to trust in the Lord and in his sovereignty, which is getting to the heart of the message. Well, let's look more into Peter's life with our third point today. So our third point is this. Peter was set free from prison by an angel. That's an amazing story to see in scriptures. So I'm going to read um, Acts chapter um, 12, verses 3 through 11. You can see up there, it's on page 404 of the story. So um, we pick up the story there, and we know that uh, Peter has been arrested. After they arrested him, they put him in prison, and he was assigned to four squads of four soldiers, 16 soldiers, to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after Passover. Now, the reason why is, is Peter's already had a time where he's arrested and walked out of the jail. So here it is getting ready to happen again, and King Herod has been around the block a few times. Not my prisoner, Peter. Peter, you're in my dungeon, not some kind of jail that you think you can just walk out of, however that happened, because you're not getting out of my place. He has a guard chained to him, and Peter's chained to the wall. He's in a dungeon, and there's a guard on the prison gate cell, and then there's some guards on the outside. So, I mean, this guy is really, really guarded well. 
Well, let's see the rest of the story, as old, old Paul Harvey used to say. So Peter was kept in the prison, but the church was praying fervently to God for him. So it's not some passive, if it's God's will, you know, they were interceding for him. A prayer meeting was called. When Herod was about to bring him out for trial, that very night, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. That's amazing. Let's just pause for a second. If in the middle of the night, somebody came into your room and cranked on the lights in the room, would that wake you up? It will wake me up. If Lisa gets up and does that, boom. I guess to I, maybe not. <laughs> but if that happens to me, boom, I'd be up out of that bed like, whoa, what happened, right? But it says in scripture that he didn't wake up. In fact, look at the rest of that verse there. Uh, so the light didn't shine and uh, wake him up. It didn't wake the guards up either. Striking Peter on the side, he woke him up and said, quick, get up. So you're so sound asleep that the lights are turned on, this bright light from an angel, and you don't wake up. And then the angel kicks you in the side or jack slaps you upside the head, one or the other. Now, if you're dead asleep and somebody kicked you in the side or jack slapped you upside the head, do you think you would like be startled away, right? Now you're all chained up. You would go like, whoa, what was that about, right? Wouldn't that happen? Surely it would happen. And if that happened and you woke up and you were chained to somebody, don't you think you would get their attention? Bright lights, angel who's speaking out loud so you hear it and kicks you in the side and you suddenly are arrested. But these uh, guards were oblivious. I don't know if they were asleep, probably not or just miraculously that whole thing's a miracle, they can't see the light, they can't hear the angel, and they can't see Peter all of a sudden be set free from his chains. Because listen to this. Also, he didn't have any um, clothes on, apparently. He's in his skivvies. As the chains fell off his wrists. So they're not unlocked, they just fall off, like, right through. Just like how Jesus passed through a wall, and was suddenly with the disciples, right? Same thing here. These chains just fall off his arms. It's a shackle chain is what they used at that time. Boom. So he just passed right through his body and down. He gets up and puts on his clothes and wraps his cloak around him. And then the angel said, follow me. Which um, in the army, that's a great thing. That's what the, the motto of the infantry is. Follow me. Now you know that came from scripture. All right. Well, I try that on my soldiers. We'll see what they think. So he went out and he followed. And he did not know that what the angel did was really happening. He thinks he's in a vision and it's all a dream and it's an imagination. But he thought he was seeing a vision. After they passed the first and second guards, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them by itself. And they went outside and passed one street and suddenly the angel left him. Now you can go read the story a little bit deeper in there, the fullness of it. We'll just say it didn't go so well the next day for those 16 guards. It was a bad day for them. No miraculous uh, delivery for them, and nobody interceding for them, because they were like the next day, because Herod was not too happy when they came to bring uh, Peter up. Now when they went to come get Peter, guess what? Uh, the gates were closed, and the guards were shocked. Like, what do you mean, Peter? He's right. Peter. Okay? And it was over for them. Curtains. So, it's interesting to see how God allowed James, the brother of John, one of the close three, to be taken. And yet, at the same time, in the very same chapter, rescues Peter. Our only answer can be to trust in the Lord and understand he's sovereign. And we're going to see those kind of things play out in our lives. The same as they had happened, we're going to see in our very same lives. We're going to pray for somebody. We're going to see a miraculous healing. And we're thinking, wow, that is amazing. The Lord will do it again. And the next time we pray for somebody for miraculous healing, and he says, not the plan that I have right now. Trust me. 
Okay? Same God, same person doing the praying, but sometimes that happens. But never give up, always be found faithful. So James had the honor to be the first of the original disciples, the first apostle to be martyred. There would be others that would follow. And uh, he's the second martyr in the Christian uh, kingdom, uh, Stephen being the first, where they died for their faith in Christ. So let's go back to Peter's story for a second. Peter well understood, this is another thing the Holy Spirit does within you. Peter well understood that Herod had a plan to kill him. He had just seen James be put to death. So it's going to be his turn next. It's going to happen the next morning. Now I want you to remember who Peter was. Just a short time ago, just a year ago, who was Peter? Peter would lie that he even knew Jesus. He would cuss out a Palestinian teenage girl about who Jesus even was because he was so afraid about saving his skin. Now we got Peter forgiven by Christ with the Holy Spirit within him. And what's this Peter doing now? He's sound asleep the night before he's going to be executed. Now some things to be said about that. Uh, we know that he was so sound asleep, the lights on, the angel had to kick him and all that. But here's the important thing to know. Peter had already resolved in his mind, whether I go or whether I'm miraculously set free, I know I'm with the Lord. I trust in him. Whatever his decision is, I'm good with, because it's his decision. So here's a recommendation. Trust in the sovereignty of our Lord and his unfailing love for you. He'll never abandon you no matter what the outcome would be. Right now, Lisa and I are praying for um, a friend in our neighborhood that Lisa has a relationship, one of our neighbor's brothers, who's a believer. And he has really severe cancer, level four. They're like, there's no hope for you. You're gonna be gone for sure. He's in the University of Michigan Hospital. Um, one of the doctors there said, we have a new treatment. We'd like to experiment on you. Since there's no hope, if we continue like this, can we experiment on you? So he said, sure, but plus I'm in God's hands. And that was months ago. So um, he, I think, is scheduled to come out of intensive care today. They're going to continue the full uh, course of the treatment. He's going to get to come home. But his attitude to his sister and shared to Lisa has been this. The Lord will heal me one way or the other. And I'm good with either of his calls. I'm going to battle here as long as he wants me to battle, but when he calls me home, I made my peace and I'm ready to go. So I think, what a great attitude to have. And it reminds me of where Peter's at, right? Trusting in the sovereignty of our Lord. Now this is a cool story I'm going to share with you. The last um, Acts chapter um, 12, verses 20 through 23. This is about King Herod. And folks, we love stories like this. King Herod is consumed by worms. What a story. Look at that cool cartoon I got there. So all the other ones that were like kind of more realistic were too gross to show you. So um, <laughs> we're going to go with the cartoon version of what this was like. So in verse uh, 20, we're going to read about uh, Herod getting it, right? Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Together they presented themselves to him has nothing to do about Peter and stuff. This is down the road from the Peter story, sometime later. After winning over Blastus, who was in charge of the king's bedroom, I don't know what that's about, uh, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food from the king's country. On the appointed day, dressed in a royal robe and seated on his throne, Herod delivered a speech to them. Now, of course, they're going to be buttering up Herod and say, oh, Herod, there's none like you. You're, you rock. You're amazing. Kind of reminds me of what happens to Hollywood stars. The assembled people shouted with a voice. It's the voice of God, not a man. And at once, an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. Now you're going, man, that must be some exaggerated story. Perhaps you're thinking about that. But it was actually historically written down by a non-Christian Roman historian named Josephus. Now Josephus was a Jewish general. Somehow he got himself saved when Rome was uh, what came into um, 
uh, sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD, but he's also a historian, a very accurate historian, and wrote about what happened during the first century. He writes about Jesus, not as his savior, but he writes about the real Jesus that really lived. That's one of the non-extra biblical sources we have about from that period about Jesus. This is what he said about Herod um, and about Herod's death. He was uh, said that Herod was arrayed in a special robe woven from silver. So he had a silver robe on, and that robe glistened in the morning sun. So he gave that speech in the morning that we read about in the Bible. He said that Herod was seized with a violent pains in his bowels, and that he was in great pain for five days before the worms broke through and he died. E, not a good way to go. Okay? So moral of the story, you're going to get it in the end. <laughs> so trust in the Lord, right? And um, also there, uh, we love it when the bad guys get it like that. That's a, that's a bad way to go, right? For sure. But here's what he did wrong. Herod, uh, you know, thought so highly of himself. He took that praise and uh, this great king became nothing. Well, it seems that we could learn some things here. One of the things I wrote down was uh, we can be all impressed with ourselves and think we're all the bomb and all that. But you know what? To the Lord, that means nothing. Right. Okay? So that's very important to know. Um, and a day is coming also when God's going to judge everybody and judge their hearts and who they are in their heart, right? Those that are saved and have the Holy Spirit, um, God's going to bring to heaven. And those that are not are going to suffer uh, fate, right? They're going to be judged and sent to hell. And um, this happened to Herod just for a moment of time, but hell's for all eternity. We don't want to see that happen to anybody, right? Now, uh, let's go to the next slide, sir. So uh, we like stories where the wicked get it. Um, that's the Old Testament judgment thing. Sometimes we like to see when God brings that severe judgment on him. But what did Jesus teach? Jesus in the New Testament taught about mercy instead. Do you remember the stories when the disciples were like, Jesus, call down fire from heaven and burn them up and stuff for those that were persecuting him. And, and Jesus didn't call down fire from heaven and burn them up. He actually rebuked the uh, disciples at that time and uh, said, no, I didn't come to do that. Instead, Jesus was about mercy, not judgment. That's so true, right? So why do we have this story in the New Covenant, the New Testament, when it's a time of his mercy? Well, the answer is this. Herod had actively made a decision to reject God's mercy. Herod knew all about Christ. He knew about his teachings, about the things that Jesus did. But he had made a decision, no. So he had turned his back. And when you turn your back on God, God's time of mercy uh, can be taken away from you, and God's judgment can come upon you. And so that's what you're seeing happening there. Not everybody gets eaten up by worms. In fact, sometimes you watch people go all through their life, and you wonder when they're going to get it, right? And they get to the very ends of their lives, and they... They die an old man or an old lady, and it seems like they never came under that time. That's because God's mercy was standing there all of their days. But I don't want to be where they're at today, right? Amen? So, um, Herod was uh, subject to this punishment like you see in the Old Testament. Now, um, we're going to be sometimes finding ourselves in times where we're in trouble, where we're going to be praying, and we're going to answer... Um, going to ask the Lord. He's going to answer. We're going to be really pleased with the results. We have a guy at New Hope Alive. He had a brain um, clots in his brain, which normally most people have a stroke and stuff, but it was in a region of his brain that just gave him super hard, unbearable headaches. But they brought him into the hospital. We all prayed at New Hope Alive. We asked somebody to be praying for John. John visited our church on Wednesdays. And we prayed for John to be healed, and praise the Lord, he was back today, hasn't had a headache one. They came up with some gizmo where they went up inside his brain and uh, pulled out the clots out of his brain and fixed where his brain was leaking, and he's, he's healed. No headaches, and he's like, I'm like a new man. Like, I'm like, whoa, how'd they do this? Praise the Lord. That's an amazing thing to see. 
right? But at other times we pray for people and it's not so. We just need to trust in the sovereignty of our Lord, right? So I think that's such an important thing. Now, one of the things that can be uh, told to you as we wrap up this morning and we invite our worship team up this morning is God has a plan and no power in heaven, no power in all the earth can stand against God's plan.